Anyone who has an even brief interest in books and reading knows exactly who Tom Clancy is, and we immediately think of spies, espionage, war, military, and historical fiction. While spending the first few years of his adult life as an insurance agent, he wrote novels in his spare time, publishing the first one in 1984 called The Hunt for Red October, which eventually grew into a highly successful multimedia franchise bearing his own name. But sticking with the subject of video games, the first few Tom Clancy related titles were simply tie-ins to Red October, and even a strategy game called Politica developed by Red Storm Entertainment. But it was their next one, Rainbow Six, that helped popularize the tactical shooter at a time when run-a-gun was all the rage. You controlled a SWAT team in their movements to counter terrorist acts and hostage situations, a game where patience and strategy was rewarded. While Ghost Recon, which wasn't even based on any of the Tom Clancy novels, took that style and brought it into a military environment. But the Tom Clancy title I'll be looking at is Splinter Cell, more specifically the first one. One, because it's the latest suggestion from Patreon, thank you Mark Goose. And two, I'm into stealth games a lot more than I realize, or at least whenever there's a stealth related stage in a video game, I really try my best to stay silent. It's a very satisfying feeling of efficiency when all the stars align. While the Splinter Cell franchise was primarily developed by Ubisoft Montreal in the 2000s, also known for Prince of Persia, Far Cry, and Assassin's Creed, the Blueprints were initially formed by a subsidiary in New York who were working on a 70s styled science fiction game called The Drift. It wasn't going too well. Although there were ideas that hadn't been seen in a video game in the 90s, like AI reacting to your weapon if you have it wielded, the weapon itself having multiple functions or visibility based on lighting, it lacked focus or a good premise to drive it into something worth playing. And eventually, Eventually, after a last-ditch attempt to make it a James Bond tie-in, the New York subsidiary folded, and resources relocated to the recently created Montreal studio. After the success of Rainbow Six and developers Red Storm Entertainment also becoming a Ubisoft studio in 2000, the Montreal developers looked at this cancelled drift project and decided to add elements that relate closely to the Tom Clancy novels to see if it worked, particularly the sum of all fears. And that's when Ubisoft realized they had something special on their hands. They also obviously took a few gameplay traits from other popular stealth franchises like Thief and Metal Gear Solid in addition. And though Tom Clancy himself didn't have that much input during development, he always had a strict set of rules in his universe, particularly no killing of civilians, and was also initially against the goggles, which were visually designed in a way to help create a unique trademark where it's the first thing that comes to mind when we think of Splinter Cell. The goggles remained and were all over the marketing. Even if it was still work in progress to the developers because they were quote, huge perfectionist, as you would, E3 impressions of Splinter Cell were very positive, winning awards for its realistic features, with the unique lighting system being the standout. Where light shined at the direction it was pointing, that it affected whether or not enemies can see you, and that most of them can be put out for improved stealth. It became one of the many reasons to own an Xbox back then, and was released on November 2002. It's another one of those games where I recognized the cover in stores way back when it was new, but because like a lot of many mature titles I noticed as a kid, I was never allowed to play them, so I didn't get a chance to appreciate how good they truly were. So what you're seeing here is my first ever playthrough of any Tom Clancy endorsed game. For a long time I always assumed it was an original Xbox exclusive, but it's also available on the PlayStation 2, Nintendo, GameCube, Game Boy Advance, and even the Nokia N-Gage. Remember those? As well as a PlayStation 3 remaster. Clearly a lot of different ways to play Splinter Cell, but for this review I'll be using the original Xbox, the highest rated version which also includes a bonus disc. Sam Fisher. I can't believe you beat me here. I like to be early. Hello, Colonel. You can use my name. The room's safe. Lambert. Good to see you again. You're in the eyes... or goggles. You're in the green goggles of Sam Fisher, a naval veteran who has been recruited by the CIA to investigate the disappearances of two officers in Georgia entering without trace. Unfortunately, one of his informants gets himself killed in a building fire just after warning Fisher that one of the officers has information that could lead to war. He couldn't save the officers in time, but was able to trace them. After recording a conversation between a former Spetsnaz soldier and a hacker, he discovers that Kumbai Nikolas, who seized power in Georgia after their president was assassinated a few months earlier, was committing atrocities in Azerbaijan, disappearing. And later on, he triggers a full cyber attack on America, officially declaring war on them and their allies. Sam is transferred all over the world and do whatever it takes to prevent war from happening. Political situation isn't good. If they are backing Nicolads, you better find rock solid proof. 
I don't want to go into World War III without a good reason. Though it certainly has a higher focus on individual characters compared to Rainbow Six or Ghost Recon, I feel like this was just another Metal Gear Solid comparison with its wonderful yet completely bonkers storytelling. Because one of the most notable criticisms of the first Splinter Cell is the plot and how cutscenes and dialogue appear cold and distant. There's not much in terms of character development as I was expecting, like it has a higher emphasis on news reports to help carry the story along. It seems to tell a situation and get straight to the point. Keep things professional and not letting emotions distract too much. Maybe the themes of cyber warfare could be too confusing for some players, at least on the first playthrough. Newspapers talking about cyber terrorism, an information crisis, information warfare. But that's the point. Though there's no Splinter Cell novel, the story and characters were written in tandem with what you expect from a Tom Clancy novel. With consulting from the Clancy team, the developer's intention was to create the most believable character for missions like these. This meant Fisher couldn't just be a rookie spy thrown into the deep end. It had to be a veteran who knew the stakes and pressures of the missions at hand, and not let emotions get the better of him. But they also didn't want to make him too old, so his hair isn't grey as originally designed. And instead of a suit or casual clothing, he's wearing the right outfit with as much equipment as he could realistically carry. And of course, Michael Ironside voicing the character. You're not dead yet. The rest of your life is all you've got, and how painful that is depends on your cooperation. According to Ironside, he initially didn't want to voice Sam Fisher because when he looked at the original script, all he saw in Fisher was a 2D killing machine. Not having any interest in video games didn't help either, but he was able to work with the developers to add enough humanity to make the character more compelling. Based on the criticism it got back in 2002, maybe not enough for some, but I'm sure they changed their minds after the sequels because they couldn't have picked a better voice actor. Michael Ironside is simply fantastic as Sam Fisher. Hi there. Hi. You're not going easy on me, are you? Ugh, not so tight, that hurts. Sorry about that. But based on my research, these are the sorts of things the developers paid attention to when writing the story and designing the gameplay. It's not like Solid Snake or Big Boss where you're fighting supernatural soldiers and robot tanks equipped with warheads using acrobatic tricks. Well, apart from this one. The character, the way the game plays, it's designed so the situations that Sam gets into are plausible in real life. Otherwise, what's the point of having Tom Clancy's name in the game's title? They also wanted to set it primarily at a place that had, quote, potential for trouble a couple of years into the future, and that post-Soviet nostalgia was the most fun topic to write for. So it's set in Georgia, which is also where Ghost Recon is set, although Matthew Furlong believed that to be a coincidence since these two games were written simultaneously by two different people. And to create the right atmosphere for these levels, the music for example, it takes heavy inspiration from Eastern European countries using real Georgian instruments, Armenian voices, Burmese drums, as well as experimented with different genres to remind you that it's set in the 2000s. It certainly helps gameplay wise because you're always trying to avoid this. Yeah, that sound cue, and this one as well. And I have to say, graphically for a 2002 game that you can barely see if you're not wearing multivision goggles, it's hardly aged. Not just in terms of how it looks, but it has a lot of little details, like when you shoot an enemy, thermal vision shows the body going cold, or when standing on a wooden floor, you can hear the bullets hit the ground when firing a weapon. Obviously, the sequels look a lot better. The frame rate drops occasionally, and like a lot of Xbox games I've played over the years, the screen tearing couldn't look any more apparent. But otherwise, it runs surprisingly well on the 360 compared to a lot of original Xbox games I played on that system. But I would recommend playing it on the Xbox One or Series X since it's backwards compatible with those systems too. Be careful, Fisher. Everything we say is being monitored. You know how nervous the brass is about exercising the fifth freedom. I'll be good. Be better than good. This quest for realism remains obvious when you're controlling Sam Fisher. The time it takes for him to climb a ledge, maneuver a wall, and sort out his equipment. I mean, I was even struggling to work out how to navigate the pause menu, ironically. The controls feel very heavy and slow on first impression. But at the same time, going through the tutorial, I was still excited with all the different moves Sam can perform and the obstacles that can be interacted with. Moving around, this game feels like it was made for the Xbox controller in mind, even the 360 one. I wonder how sneaking works on the PC version considering that fluent sneaking is required. In fact, the only thing I consistently struggled on was trying to grab onto a ledge, usually through a wall jump. It's particularly annoying because it usually makes a loud noise an enemy can hear. Oh.
That might be the only time that splits move comes in handy, but that's because the levels have a lot of variety. Set mostly indoors, there are a lot of vents, beams, and surface types that make for great PE obstacle courses. And because of the realism, the best spot to hide or sneak past isn't as obvious, at least on first impression. You always feel like you can move anywhere in any building. However, there's barely anything in the way of weapons and equipment, no map HUD, no indication that you're going the wrong way, say if you're taking too long. An enemy's ability to notice something is almost ungodly, and you die after a couple shots. No matter how used to it you think you are, it usually throws something different each mission. Just on this one level for example, the first attempt I was spotted by an enemy. Second attempt I knocked him out, but I was caught by the security camera. And further ahead, this part here, I kept failing simply because I was shimmying between balconies even in the dark. That's one alarm too many. The mission's over. And it was until I found out it was because this body was technically not hidden because it wasn't in the dark, despite being on top of an elevator. I wasn't allowed to trigger the alarm once, which makes sense, but point is, right from the start, it's completely no nonsense. Splinter Cell is all trial and error, knowing where you can't move, where the enemies and cameras are, and hiding all your tracks. You can spend a couple of minutes completely still just reading the enemy's movement, waiting for the right opportunity to pounce. The fact that it has a checkpoint system is the only thing that stops it from being stupidly unforgiving. Because when you restart, every attempt has to be as by the numbers as possible. You can't rush, no matter how frustrated you get. Your presence is affected by visibility based on the brightness of a room or the surface you're sneaking on. Yeah, a wooden board is louder than concrete. Well, duh. But playing Splinter Cell, you think about it a lot more. Like, if you go into this expecting it to be like other games where stealth is simply about not having the enemy see you with a lot more power than you should, then it'll tear you apart. Fortunately, it almost never feels unfair because there are a lot of believable factors that cause enemies to spot you thanks to the way the levels are designed, which for 2002 when Metal Gear Solid 2 already existed, was quite detailed. Splinter Cell is based strongly on the lighting of areas where it's all about staying in the dark as much as possible. On the bottom right, there's a brightness bar which shows how visible you are to the enemy, so when you walk under a light, you're clearly a lot more visible, but they can either be switched off or shot at to create a darker area. Hello? Who's there? I really love this feature. It's the one thing you're always glancing at and creates scenarios for very satisfying takedowns. It's the only thing that came to me naturally since I played Metal Gear Solid 3 before Splinter Cell, where it used a camouflage system which had a percentage of how hidden you are to the enemies. I'm not here. That's right. You've lost existence privileges until the mission's over. As I mentioned with the game being set a couple of years into the future, this also meant developers had a little bit of creative freedom with weapons and gadgets. They were looking into what the armies were researching in 2002 and putting it in the game so while futuristic, it seemed believable that it would have existed by 2004. Another aspect of the realism key to Splinter Cell's identity. You still have all the typical basic equipment of silent pistol and lock picker, but with the assault rifle it has attachable gadgets, a laser microphone for eavesdropping and, of course, the iconic multivision goggles. And they're not just a gimmick, all of it is used prominently at least once, apart from the sticky camera. While it's funny to hit enemies with it and see the camera bounce on the ground like so, every time I tried to use it properly, I kept getting spotted. It doesn't make sense. But while you have the means to kill enemies, ammo for anything is low and very rare to come by, so it encourages patience and stinginess to pass through. Otherwise, you'll risk screwing yourself over near the end of a mission. The worst example was trying to protect hostages from a dozen enemies. Because I didn't know I was going to be in a situation like that, as you can see, I was completely ill-prepared. Therefore, I had to reload the last checkpoint using as little ammo as possible. Anyone who's played Splinter Cell knows how unforgiving this part is since these controls aren't designed for high-paced action. Damnation. I'm going down there. The plank, you're coming with me. His men are mercenaries. Their only cause is money and intimidation. So, once Grinko's dead, he's scattered. Let's hope so.
The difficulty mostly comes in brief stretches of being forced to take out multiple enemies and rules for individual missions. Things like finding endless data drives, defusing explosives, interrogating certain targets for intel, not being allowed to trigger an alarm or kill a single person so you have to resort to non-lethal methods instead. And as you can see from the head torches and turrets, enemies having more ways to easily identify you. But by that point, you're used to the controls, checkpoints appear more frequently, and you develop those survival instincts, always checking where the enemies could be and putting out any lighting before you enter the next room. Although since the game is linear, a lot of the time there's only one possible pathway to advance without being spotted, and can only be discovered through trial and error. But fortunately, the gameplay is fun and frustrating enough at the same time that you want to work it out. You usually discover it after the second attempt, so it's not insanely cryptic or anything like that. And even if you know where everything is, you still need the patience and timing to do exactly what you want, and the intensity is always there, especially on the first playthrough. With stealth games, they can mentally exhaust you faster than other genres, but since Splinter Cell uses barely any dialogue and cutscenes compared to something like Metal Gear where there's a 30 minute cutscene every 30 minutes, and is almost completely focused on the gameplay like Sam is in a VR simulation where individual missions can take up to an hour with barely any room to breathe, your eyes are always peeled to this game, but in a good way. Now I know these are two completely different games, but playing Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell gives me the same feelings I had when I reviewed Oddworld Abe's Odyssey in 2019, only reviewing it because it's a Patreon request and initially hated it for its unforgiving difficulty. It certainly remained frustrating throughout, but if you remain persistent right after the mission is complete, it can be a very satisfying experience. I honestly like Splinter Cell enough that I'm seriously considering getting Pandora tomorrow and Chaos Theory for my collection. Maybe even other Tom Clancy titles like Rainbow Six or Ghost Recon. And that was one of the many reasons why Ubisoft was so successful in the 2000s. They held a monopoly on games bearing Tom Clancy's name with so many to keep count. There's no doubt anyone watching this would have at least one in their collection, but the first Winter Cell in particular, even to this day, is excellent. I still prefer the Metal Gear titles for having more variety and content, but I respect the length the developers went to make this realistic without feeling too much like a general stealth simulator, thinking twice about every corner or jump. And that lighting system, it was a lot of fun looking at different ways to get around the enemies with your own pathway through the darkness. And I definitely recommend it no matter what the console PC, even if you're not a fan of the stealth genre, it might surprise you. 